Vietnam War campaign. And what was your branch of service? United States Marine Corps. What was your highest rank? E-4, Corporal. And in what general locations did you serve starting, you know, from basic training and then going forward? When I first enlisted, they, they took me to uh, Camp Pendleton, California for boot camp, which was quite an experience. <laughs> um, I guess I'll never forget uh, going in and getting off the... Uh, off the, the bus there and they marched us in a room, made us stand on some little footsteps there and then really gave us some once over and then uh, I remember they took it, cut all my hair off and that was back in the 60s when people had long hair in it. And so I'll never forget that as well. But then I did my basic training, my boot camp uh, there in uh, Camp Pelton, California. And then after that they gave us a short little leave to go home. I think it was two weeks, maybe three. And then we came back for ITR and guerrilla warfare training. And then from there to Okinawa, where we went through staging, and then from there to Tanang, Vietnam. Okay, and what was, was ITR? ITR, that was infantry training. Uh, I forget the, uh, the correct words for it, uh, because uh, the, guerrilla, the guerrilla warfare training so sticks out in my mind, kind of overshadows everything else. So, uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? Well, I enlisted and uh, right out of high school. <laughs> and uh, as, as I told you, I enlisted for the Navy. And uh, when they had us all lined up, and, uh, I don't know if it was a drill, ins drill instructor or not, the Marine Corps, but he had on a Marine Corps uniform. And he come walking through and said, I need some volunteers for the Marine Corps. You, you, and you, and I happen to be one to use. <laughs> And so I wound up in the, in the Marine Corps, but um, once I got to Vietnam, I was glad I had that training. So. Um, where were you living at the time that you enlisted? I was living in a little town called Walker, Louisiana, way down south in the swamps, just an old country boy. And I believed I wanted to protect our freedoms here in the United States of America. I, I went in with that impression and that's what I went to war for to be sure my children and my grandchildren could uh, have the same freedom that I enjoyed. So just tell me about your first days in service. You said basic training was a little bit of a wake up call. Oh Lord, yeah. Amen. <laughs> yeah, we uh they took it in, they cut our hair off, and they, I mean, you know, the drill instructors were real loud, screaming in your face, and, uh, I mean, it was just, it was real bad. And I, I, I remember laying in my bunk in one of the billets there, I guess they called it a, a Quarantine hut, that's what it really was. Yeah. And I remember laying there and said, oh God, I'm gonna wake up pretty soon, it's gonna all be over, there'll be a dream. <laughs> but. Uh, and one of the drill instructors kind of, I don't know if he took a liking to me or uh, he, was, uh, he was from up north. I called him the Yankee drill instructor. And uh, he called me the Kunas. <laughs> and uh, he used to take uh, pleasure in beating me with a pogo stick. You know, they'd take a stick and they'd put big tapes on each end of it. And if you didn't do what you was told fast enough, and even if you did sometimes, they'd punch you in the stomach with that, you know, or... Uh, they they were careful not to leave marks, but it it, it taught you respect. I hear you that. <laughs> and of course, you know we would do our three four miles every morning with our packs and full gear, and it it was uh, it was quite an experience. Um, but uh, you learned when you was given order, you followed it you know, quite quickly. <laughs> but uh, it was a shock when we got to Vietnam. You know that was. I uh, still don't talk about it much. It's something you'd have to live through to know what it was about. Yeah. So, after your boot camp, you went from from your training to uh, Okinawa on your way. Yes, we. Uh, they would. They flew us there on a commercial jet, um, and we would go there for staging to see where you would go to Vietnam, which which company, it, which whatever you'd be in, what part of the country. Uh, and 
once they got us all together there and where we were going, then they sent us right on out to the to, to Vietnam. And uh, when we landed, uh, the, the flight line was under a mortar attack. And you were landing? Yes. And so I got broke in right quick. Yeah. Welcome to Vietnam. Welcome to Vietnam. So I'm sure you remember that very well. Yeah, and I was, I had just turned 18. I was very, very young. I turned 18 in August. In uh, December, we were in Vietnam. And um, I was scared to death. I just have to admit that, but uh, I did what I had to do. Uh, but it was, it was very <laughs> awakening, I guess, would be a, a way of putting it. Do you, uh, do you recall the, the actions or reactions of those that were with you, that were around you? Or you were yeah, there was a very, uh, varied reactions from just falling down on the, on, on the ground or in the plane where we're in the plane. There was just outright fear, you know. But when we heard our <laughs> our, our uh, platoon sergeant scream out orders, we just, you know, you just kind of do what you got to do. Um, so you arrived in Vietnam and, and what you got off the plane, what was what was your, your mission, your task? What do you remember those those first days and what were you? What it's were you kind of a blur to me. I, I, I remember the, the mortars hitting. I, I remember the, the orders being screamed at us and uh, I, I remember uh, getting behind uh, some sandbags somewhere uh, and and uh, you know, and I remember firing my rifle for the for the first time, and with the thoughts coming to mind that I was trying to kill somebody. And, uh, that was my first thought, you know. Although I couldn't see them, they were there, but not I couldn't see them. But um, so we lost a couple guys that day. You know. and the day you got yeah. the day they, the couple guys that were with you that arrived with you. Yeah. Yeah, they, that first day was their last day. I remember one one episode too. Uh, we had outhouses, you know, uh, <laughs> and the mortar shell hit one of those outhouses, and, <laughs> and they had a couple guys that was going in there. I don't know if they made it in there, but <laughs> I'll never forget that either. It was one of those things. Yeah. You decided they didn't need to go so far. I think they went in their in their britches, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it, it was there was there. You had to laugh. Um, if you didn't, you'd go crazy. I mean, and some of the guys did go, you know, not crazy crazy, but they just didn't care anymore, and they just did not. You know, and there are stories after stories, but. You know, kids handing your life grenades, um, going into villages, and you don't know who your enemy is. And, and getting orders it, towards the end there not to fire unless you're fired upon. And I mean, it was just really, really bad. And it had to be a challenge. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's <clears throat> pretty hard when you got a kid who could be the enemy. Yeah. Yeah, you don't, you, we didn't know, and, you know, I can remember uh, we were on the back of a deuce and a half, and the kids, I told you before, came up and handed me a live grenade, which, you know, uh, thank God I, I realized what it was, and I was able to catch the pin before it popped loose, but he pulled the pin out of the handle, and the hand, all I had to do was let go of it, but... I can remember with the, the stock of my rifle butting the kid like that, and I don't know how bad it hurt him, you know, but you don't know what to what to do. What else are you going to do? So, yeah. But uh, the martyr attacks, constant, um, you know, and, and I, can, I can remember, and I'll tell you on this, this uh, interview here that I 
I can remember one one night when we were on the mortar attack and we had we had dug some trenches and we stacked up sandbags and that's where we would try to defend our position. And we had hooches, we called them, little old buildings that we stayed in. And I can remember one night in particular, a bunch of nights, but one in particular. Uh, I can remember the mortars were coming in and, and we were running around, double timing around, proper military term, to try to get to our to some cover because they, they would come in body waves. I mean, it didn't matter how many you shot, they just kept coming and coming. But I can remember running around that corner and I, they were firing tracer rounds as well. And I can, I saw them rounds go through me. It was a miracle from God. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And I'm sure other vets could tell you stories. <laughs> yeah. What, uh, this was at the name? The name of Vietnam. We were guarding the flight line and we would do search and destroy missions from there. Uh, sometime we would, we'd be flown with choppers to a LZ somewhere. Um, sometimes they, we'd go out and do some halves and, and park at a certain place and go from there and uh, hope to return to there, <laughs> but to be picked up, but yeah. That was our main objective, was to, to guard the, the flight line for the jets. And the first, the Tet Offensive by uh, 68, I believe it was, you know. Uh, they had so many body waves and so many gooks, North Vietnamese, coming in that the jets would take off, and as soon as they got up, they would release their bombs. Oh, really? Yeah, and that's how close they were. But we, we followed them off, I think it was, I don't remember how many days it was. We lost a lot of men, a lot of men. But we, uh, <laughs> maybe it'd be some Marines watching this. Hoorah, Semper Fi, we, we secured the flight line. <laughs> so. um, so you had, you had some hectic times. Um, and I know there were there were some times when you were wounded. Mm -hmm. Do you recall that situation? How that occurred? <clears throat> well, not not a lot about it. It was um, uh, it was shrapnel wounds from from a rocket and mortar. I, I don't remember both times. Um, I have pretty much blocked it out of my mind, um, and it's. It's not much to tell you on a search and destroy mission and the mortars come in and like they always say, the one you don't hear is the one that gets you. And uh, the first time I woke up in, in the hospital in Vietnam, in Da Nang, Vietnam, it was kind of, I don't know, it wasn't really a hospital, it was just where, the, um, where they took you. And uh, I got blood poison from that wound and so I Stayed out, stayed out of the jungles for a while, and then um, I got my arm and my eye and my stomach. But, um, and then the second one, they put me on a hospital ship, and sent me to Japan. Okay. Do you know why? Why the two different? Was the second one worse than the first one? Is that what it was? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it was almost, you know, that's about the end of the, when they started pulling people out. I want to say it was in 69, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe the early part of 70. What were your dates? Do you remember the date you arrived and the date that you actually left? I think it was, it was January of 68, because we were in Okinawa in 67. December, and um, I don't remember the dates after that, because I spent, I could figure it out probably because we did 13 month tours, and I didn't quite finish the first tour, uh, because I volunteered for a second tour, which was uh, another six or eight months, 
I think it was six months. And I was wounded and didn't finish that. That's when they sent me to Japan. So, so you, how much time did you actually end up spending there then? You did one tour with six months, and your second tour you did about? I did, I think, 11 and a half months of the first tour, and maybe three of the second, three or four. Do you remember what your thinking was as to, to why you did a second tour? Why you chose? Yeah, it's because my, my, my friends were there, the ones that were left. And um, I, I don't know, I just, that's what I remember thinking anyway. So you received a Purple Heart for, for each of those incidents? Correct. Do you remember receiving those? Was I remember. You at the time I remember one, <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad you asked. I, it just comes to mind. It's been so long for me, um, and uh, even the the military terms have changed now. Yeah, I can imagine what our two boys would be saying, how they would word these things, and it's just so different now. You know? But I can remember it was very. Uh, it was one of my most. Uh, proud for moments, I guess, after coming back. Um, because uh, we were in uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And this was just before I got out in 71. And uh, I'd like to tell you, well, I don't remember the two medals. One of them was the Purple Heart. The other one might have been the, the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. I don't remember, but um, they had all these, <laughs> these uh, officers lined up that were receiving their what we call fire watch ribbons and and here i am uh, a corporal uh, really just messed up pretty bad you know in in the mind uh, and i can remember standing there and they, uh, i think it was general was walking down handing out the medals boom 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 and he got to me and he stopped and he started reading that, you know, the citations, and, and his hands were shaking. And I'll never forget, I felt myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but that was, that was uh, one of the best moments for me. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. Well, and you can imagine how the, the officers who got their fire watching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those officers have never been out of state, you know. And, they hadn't been uh, been to war yet. I'm sure they would wind up there at some point. But yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember uh, what, what other awards or medals you were you received? I have I have a hard time remembering them. Um, uh, uh, good conduct medal I got twice. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. Uh, I, you know, and of course the Vietnamese ribbon with the, with the campaigns and the, the victory, the V for victory. Uh, I don't remember most of them, uh, but my wife does. <laughs> She's quite good at that. You know? um, so how was uh, communication while you're in Vietnam? Uh, it was totally different from what it is now. We, we waited so long for mail call just to get a, a letter. And every now and then we'd get a little package, you know, cookies or something like that. And some things I wouldn't talk about on this that, you know, that girls sent some of the, some of the men. So, but uh, it, we didn't have any communication other than that. We got mail and we wrote letters. And that was it. And then, then the Marine Corps had something. I don't know if ever, the Army had it too, but we had what was called R&R. &R. And uh, I don't remember. I never got mine because I was wounded and back and forth. And, but I don't remember how often they got that, maybe once or twice during their tour. And they got to go out of country. And um, then they could make phone calls and things. Now, I don't know if that's true of everybody that was there in Vietnam. Uh, you know, it could have been different for people uh, 
uh, in different places in country. I, I don't know. But I know that's all we have. Yeah, Thailand. For the R and R, they could go Thailand. They could go Japan. Um, that's the only two that I heard a lot about. What was the food like? The what? The food? <laughs> well, it it kept us alive. <laughs> it was um, it was not real good, but it was it's what we had, and we eat it. Uh, we used to, you know, joke around. If you found something in your food, it was just a little fresh meat. <laughs> it, might, it might have been whatever, but, you know. But, yeah. And uh, sea rats wasn't that bad. Maybe I'm strange, but I, I kind of liked them. You know, got to like them. Um, so. And I could tell you about one of my good friends that, that got shot in the stomach. Uh, <clears throat> I remember being beside him, his name was Sam. And uh, I can remember kneeling down with him after the firefight and uh, uh, the corpsman was there working on him. And, and uh, I never forget, he, he looked up at me and he smiled. He said, hey, Dave, I'm going home then. <laughs> So, yeah, it was things like that, you know. And, but that was some good men over there. And and what I always, you know, uh, one, the nightmare that stays with me is, why did I come back? I wasn't half the Marine a lot of those guys were. And uh, I don't know. Other than God had a job for me here. So. Uh, I know you, you told me earlier that you had lost some friends in your phone with some of the pictures. Um, mm -hmm. Do you recall some of their, what they did, or some of the things that made them stick out as, as your friends? Obviously, you're really close to them. Yeah, they, they were, we were real close. And again, I, I, Something just happened to me, and I've just I just tried to block all that out. And uh, for the first years I was back, I was real bad. Um, I, I was real bad, I, being in fights all the time, and um, I'd go out into the swamps of Louisiana and just stay out there for three, four days. And during that time, I somehow I learned how just to block that out. And I can't really recall it now, per se, but I guess it comes out a lot in nightmares at night. I guess my wife could tell you that. Yeah. But I remember their faces and some of their names. Uh, I, but that's about it. Did you, while you were in Vietnam, did you do anything special for good luck? You know, did you? Some people wore St. Christopher medal. Some people had something they got from their picture from their mother or something, or their girlfriend or whatever. Do you have any? Yeah, in, in our little hooch, I had pictures of my girlfriend and some of my family, but I didn't have a rabbit's foot or anything like that. I just just did what I had to do. It's a lot. I learned how to pray a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Lord makes a lot of people in the Bible read. Yeah, I, it, it makes you a believer. It not, you know, it, like everybody's got the old cliche, there are no atheists and foxholes. You know? uh, but I was, a, I was a believer in God before I went there, having, you know, been brought up in a Bible Belt down in the South and had heard all the, uh, the preaching and had been to Sunday school and things like that. Uh, but it became real then, you know. It became real. And <clears throat> that's not why I became a preacher, though. That's, that, I've heard people say that, you know, but that, that's not true. Uh, Vietnam is not why you became a no, preacher? No, not at all. No, it, I had a call, on God, a call of God on my life. 
and it had nothing to do with Vietnam. I can remember crying out to God in the firefights and uh, watching my friends die. I remember calling out to God, Oh God, save me. Oh God, if you'll just get me through this. But that's not, that's not why I'm a preacher. No. I'm a preacher because God called me and put a love of people in my heart to tell them about Jesus so they can be saved. Uh, that, that was my calling. Again, it had nothing to do with Vietnam. But I do know this. If, if I would have died from one of those wounds in Vietnam, I surely wouldn't have went to heaven. <laughs> I would have lost. Drank, curse, fight. And, um, and once you've shot somebody, you just that never, ever leaves you. And speaking of that, something else that never, ever leaves you is when you smell human flesh burning. You'll never, ever, ever get over that. So. And again, remember, most of us were seven, 18, 19, even some 17-year-olds that snuck in. And we were just kids. And we learned how to be men right quick. Recall any humorous or unusual events? Things that oh, plenty of them. Yeah, like like I showed you the pictures. You know, we we found ways to amuse ourselves. Of course, you know we had when we had some downtime, which was not often, but when we did, uh, we put you know we played baseball games and football and uh, whatever we could do, and then we joke around and. Uh, just whatever we could find to amuse ourselves. And of course, there was always a lot of drinking, uh, whenever we could. And I heard about there being a lot of marijuana and stuff, but I just never was interested in that. Uh, I heard about it, but I, I never. None of my, none of my uh, uh, buddies, comrades, friends, none of them did that I know of. No, I didn't. Maybe I was just blind to it, I don't know. But now I know when the, the Viet Cong, the gooks, <laughs> when they were coming at us in these body waves, I was told most of them were probably pretty doped up, you know, just coming and coming and coming. Uh, they would come and we had, we had uh, put up barbed wire fences and whatnot. And they would come and, and we'd shoot them and some of them would fall on that and others would step on and come out. So, yeah. Just raving maniacs. Didn't, didn't care. So. Um, what did you think of the, the, uh, the officers and with their, the officers in your unit? Your NCOs? <laughs> in, in my platoon, in, in, uh, in the company that I was in, uh, I had the highest respect for them. Now we were taught that, I know, but I really, I really learned to respect our platoon commander. Uh, and I know there were a lot that were probably not so uh, deserving of respect, but I just, I did. I really you know, respected them. I've seen them put their life on the line several times. And uh, the guys that I was, that I worked under, I don't believe they ever told me to do anything they wouldn't do themselves if they, if, you know, if they thought they had to. So, I've heard stories, different stories, and, and not to be talking about another branch of the military, but about where some army guys would shoot their lieutenants, you know. I don't know if that went on in the Marine Corps, but I know it didn't where I was at, and I would not have put up with it. I mean, you don't you don't do that. You know? Even if you don't like your commander, <laughs> your platoon leader, <clears throat> your drill sergeant, I mean, you don't you don't kill them. But 
Vietnam yeah. makes strange people. You know? okay. mm. uh, did you keep a, a journal at all? No. no. Not at all. So do you, uh, when you're servicing, did, do you remember the day that you were ETS or that you... I was discharged? Discharged. Let me think for a moment. I might. <laughs> uh, I can remember shortly before and shortly after. I don't remember in any detail about what happened other than I think they lined us up in, in a platoon formation and those of us who were being discharged, we got a discharge paper. Uh, and I would have re-enlisted, but having uh, the wounds that I had, no, I don't think they wanted me to. Did you get your discharge papers there in Vietnam? No, no. Back in the States? California. No, wait a minute. No, I'm sorry. North Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. What was the environment like? Do you remember, do you remember coming back from Vietnam? Do you remember what was the environment? Oh, like? yeah. How were, you, were you treated particularly differently? Or? Well, yeah, I could tell you about that, and that that also is is really some scars on me that that I have a very very hard time with trying to put behind me. Uh, when we came back, uh, of course, I was on on that hospital ship, and and then they flew us from Japan uh, to California, and uh, when I when I got there, I can remember. Bunch of us running off and kissing the ground, you know, falling down, kissing, and and I also remember what the people said that were there. I mean, they were calling us baby killers, and they were uh, really uh, putting us down, and it was not a very pretty sight. These are people who just met you at the airport. Yeah, the yeah, some young people with their back in the 60s, yeah. yeah, sixties and seventies. Uh, uh, what they call them, the love childs, I think. <laughs> Make love, not war, was a big thing. Yeah, yeah but that was a very, uh, very bad. Uh, and I have a hard time getting over it today. Uh, and I just really, really had a hard time with it. Yeah, but we were glad to be back. And then they took us from there and they took us out in the desert out there for some psychological retraining or whatever they did to us. Uh, they made us stay out there for two weeks and they let us go home. So when you, when you got out of the Army, when you were discharged, um, I know you said you had some rough times afterwards. Uh, did you eventually go back to go to work or go to school? What, what did you do? How did time progress? How did, well, yeah. To... Yeah, when I first got out, uh, out of the Marine Corps, it was looking for a job, and of course, it did a lot of drinking, a lot of just being bad. <laughs> and uh, got married and had children, and uh, which it was really bad on my children, too. Uh, you know, the nightmares, the screaming at night, running outside in my underwear at night, you know, and the fights and the, just being gone for three or four days. Nobody knew where I was at. But it was it was tough trying to get over that. But I, I landed job after job. Uh, and then uh, when I uh, was called to God when I, uh, and surrendered my life to, to Jesus, surrendered to the ministry, um, things started looking up. And, uh, still, there's problems, and even today, my wife can tell you this is really, really, it's tough on her. And uh, still, and uh, but I don't think, I don't know if my kids will ever get over it, and I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but I help jobs mostly. So, what was the, the time from the time you were discharged until you? in the ministry, how much time was that? Mm, maybe a year. Maybe wasn't long. Really. 
I was just short in 72. I don't remember the year when I was ordained. I don't remember, maybe it was in the mid to, mid 70s, late 70s, maybe. So you've been a minister for most of your life? Quite a while. Quite a while. Um, you do, uh, did you have any educational? The ideal or anything that you used after you got back? Or no, I uh, wasn't available to you. You just didn't use it. It probably was available, but I don't know if it's that way now. But then I just wanted to get away from. I didn't want anything to do with. Didn't want anything to do with the military. Didn't want anything to do with anything. <laughs> you know, uh, I had. I didn't. I got no GI Bill or anything like that. But I did get, get to go to uh, to seminary. Uh, where I, I graduated with a master's in theology. Yeah. So, <clears throat> while you're in the service, did, did you, I know you, you want to put all that behind you, but did you make any close friendships in the service that somehow you kept contact over the years at all, or no. was that part of keeping everything, just, just leaving it? Yeah, behind? just leaving it behind. I, <clears throat> you know, I, I made good friends. It should have been lifetime friends. So. But I couldn't. And so we just kind of parted ways. And, uh, Seeing them would be reliving with you. Yeah. yeah. I've kind of withdrawn. and I, It's like I'm, a, I'm out in the desert by myself most of the time. And, uh, my wife keeps pulling me back, but I keep... You know, especially when I begin to remember all that, all that happened and seeing, her, you know, all of what we saw. Um, I mean, there there's some, some horrible stories that I could tell, but... Um, so you just kind of withdraw within yourself. And, and uh, I don't know if everybody's like that, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's many. yeah, and a lot of a lot of my friends, a lot of my uh, fellow Marines, and I'm sure it's Army and all the rest, and, but they never got over it, and they took it to their graves, and that's what put them in an early grave. It's so many that suffered after the after effects of that war because it was so. And I, you know, and I'll tell you the truth that you know, at times we didn't really know why we were there. I went there as a a young Marine, proud to be a Marine, super proud to be an American, and I was going to fight for the freedom of America. You know, they filled my head with all this garbage, and uh, and I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't have said that because it was you know. But when we got there, like uh, Monkey Mountain, for instance. We would lose all kind of men taking that mountain. And then they'd tell us to pull off. Go back and take it again. What are we doing, you know? And I'll never forget the, the Marine Corps Commandant that year. Uh, they brought him on, on camera and on the radio. I think we were listening to it on the radio. And they asked him, what, what do we have to do here to, to end this war? How many more Marines do you think we need over here? And he said, I'm going to tell you people something. Right on television or radio, I'm going to tell you something. He said, you let me let my Marines go and I'll give you Vietnam in two weeks. They fired him. No longer will see you the Commandant of the Marine Corps. So we went on taking the same ground and giving it back. And... Uh, and I'm sure there are a lot more stories from a lot of men who remember a lot more than me. So you're probably better off interviewing somebody else you know, that hasn't uh, blocked all that out. They could really tell you some things. Well, everybody's got their part. Yeah. Yours, yours is valued. Um,
that leads me to your, uh, you know, we had the Gulf War and, and these other things that come on since after Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, how your experiences in Vietnam influenced your thoughts about war and about uh, American going to war? And, uh, I, I don't really know how to answer that. Um, War became real to me. Uh, death became more real than it ever was. Suffering. Um, and uh, the old cliche, freedom is not free. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know. I don't really know how to answer that, yeah. Joined any veterans organizations? Were you? Uh, well, mostly since I came here to Connecticut. Uh, it took me a long, long time to, to deal with any of that, but with the, with the help of my wife and other friends, uh, I'm now involved with the VFW. I'm a chaplain there uh, with the old or survivors. I'm a chaplain for them. Uh, I'm involved with the American Legion. I'm a chaplain there. And uh, and so my wife's in all kinds of uh, veterans organizations. And so we, we do a lot of work, her much more than me, but we do a lot of work with the veterans. And I hope that we can do more uh, now that we're retiring and we'll, we'll be able to be more into that. Do you think that is in part, a big part, because of your, your service? Oh, or do you think you would be at that point? No, it, it's two, two really uh, uh, pushing factors, if you will, my service and my wife. Because she is a, <laughs> she's a real big uh, military, support military veterans, and, mm -hmm. uh, and she's the one that got me all involved in it. I had never been before. I came here going on 13 years ago now. Yeah, yeah. And that, that being because I had such bad experiences, I guess, with, uh, with VA hospital there in, in New Orleans. It was terrible. It was real bad. <clears throat> yeah, people just went there to die. And if you was a veteran, one thing you didn't do, you didn't go to the veteran hospital. <laughs> but it's so different up here now. Uh, I've been to the VA hospitals a lot here, uh, New England and uh, West Haven. And they've been very, very good to me. And they've been taking care of me. Is there anything you would like to add that we have not covered in this interview? I, not really. Uh, other than the veterans need all the support they can get. And some of them will never, will never speak to you about what's going on inside of them. And uh, for many, the war is never over. You, you never get over the, the friends you lost. Because in, in times like that, your brothers become closer than anybody, friend you've ever had. I mean, you trust your life with them. And to watch them die, and a lot of these vets come back, they don't get over that. And so they, they need a lot of help and support. Not to baby them or, or, or to give them handouts but to be a friend and give them opportunities to serve and, and to work. And me, uh, my biggest goal, desire, is to get them to know Jesus Christ. Because that's, uh, he can make all things right. Jesus. And... Uh, and so that's what I, my, my goal is, to get the message to them, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ.
Well, William, I'd like to thank you for your service and thank you for taking the time to sit down and share this interview with us. I, I really uh, appreciate you letting me do this. Uh, I, I would really like to do this. I don't know if I can on this, but I'd like for my wife to come over here. Could, is that possible? Could she do that? Yes, she can do it. Just, I, I would just like for people to see the one that's gotten me through this. <laughs> so, all right. You need a chair? No, fine. This, this is the lady that supported me. And uh, because I have been diagnosed with uh, severe PTSD uh, and can't remember things and uh, can't really function too well, and she's the one that's brought me through this. And this is what veterans need. Not only do they need Jesus, but they need somebody like this. And so I don't know if you'd want to ask her something or or if that can be on this, I don't know, but I think it's very important to me that she be on this in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. Well, I would just, I would just ask that what, ask Linda, what, what is the most significant thing that has, has brought you two together? That this, this, oh, that that is. Obviously, William has had some issues. He had some, some, and you met him after this fact. Mm -hmm. You stuck with him. So, just why? I mean, what keeps you going? What keeps you there for him? Well, our faith keeps us going, and uh, we actually met because we were both pastors, and he was in Arkansas. I was in Massachusetts, but um, <laughs> uh, we met through a Christian organization, and uh, it was our faith in Jesus Christ that brought us together and the call of God upon our lives that, you know, we understood that we had a ministry to do uh, together. Mm -hmm. And so that cemented it, <laughs> and uh, we got yeah. married, and uh, we've been in ministry together ever since. But, you know, the aspects of uh, the war, we have two boys that are serving in the present war on terror, and so mm -hmm. that's a humongous part of our life is supporting the troops and veterans. We have many military ministries mm -hmm. and uh, veteran ministries and, and mm -hmm. that's a, a great focus for us you know now yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you and thank you Linda